Hey guys, in this video series we are going to build an app with Android architecture components, one of which is a library called Room. But before we talk about the different architecture components, let me quickly show you how the end result will look. So we are going to build a simple note taking app, where each node has a title, a description and a number for the priority. They are stored in SQLite and they are all displayed as items in a recycler view. We can add new nodes, like this. We can modify existing nodes and update them. We can delete nodes by swapping them off. And over this menu option up here, we can also delete all nodes at once. This app is not very fancy or special, but the point of this tutorial is to get started with Android architecture components and learn how to implement them. In the first part, I will give an overview about the different architecture components that we will use in this app and how they work together. And in the upcoming parts, we will then learn about each component in more detail while we are building the app. I will try to explain everything in a way that a beginner can understand it too. And I am not a professional myself, but it definitely helps if you already have some experience in Android development. So the Android architecture components are a bunch of different libraries that are supposed to help us build more robust and maintainable apps. But what does maintainable mean and why do we need an architecture in the first place? As beginners, we often just put almost all the code directly into our activities and fragments. We store and process data there, we start and stop different long-running tasks, and we manage their life cycles in the different callbacks. I think as a beginner that's okay, because we have to start somewhere, and for smaller projects, that's not really a problem. But when an app gets bigger, this tightly coupled code can turn into a problem because it gets harder and harder to make changes to it or even completely swap implementations without always having a huge ripple effect through the rest of the code base. And managing the activity and fragment lifecycle becomes harder the more stuff we put in there. Also, the so-called spaghetti code is hard to test because many different parts depend on each other. And architectural patterns are there to help us create more separated modular components where each part of the program has a well-defined responsibility and can ideally be modified or replaced without touching any other component. But until not long ago, the stance of the Android team about that topic was, we provide you the framework and the core classes that interact with the Android system, but you developers have to decide yourself how you organize your app and which architecture you use. This model also gives application developers the freedom to choose whatever framework they want inside their application for their internal framework. So that means that we on the Android team don't have to get involved in debates about whether MVC is better than MVP or whether MVP is better than MVVPM. You guys can pick whatever makes sense to you. And while we still have this freedom to build our apps in the way we want, the Android team decided to actually give a recommendation on a certain app architecture and also provides the necessary tools in form of the architecture components. And they have announced all of this at the Google I.O. 2017. The very first thing we are shipping is an architecture guide on developer Android.com. Now, for over years, you have been asking us for our opinion, like how do we think that an application should be built? And this is that guide. So we believe that it's a very good, covers lots of application cases. Second, we are shipping a new set of libraries that we call architecture components. These are more fundamental components where you can build your application on top. Now, we will not use all the available architecture components, but I would say the most important ones that make sense to learn first. We won't use data binding, navigation, paging, or work manager in this video, but some of them, like work manager, are still in the alpha version at the time of making this video anyways. But of course, I will make videos about the other components in the future as well, so stay tuned for that. So let's take a look at how our app will be structured. As I already mentioned, we will save our data in an SQLite database. In the past, working with SQLite in Android was quite complicated. We had to create an SQLite open helper class, write a lot of code to create the different tables and make operations on them, and small mistakes, like forgetting a comma or a space in an SQL statement, would cause a runtime exception, which then caused the app to crash. And in the worst case, this could happen while the app was already in production. For this reason, the Android team created the Room Persistence Library, which is a wrapper around SQLite that takes care of most of the complicated stuff that we previously had to do ourselves. We have to write much less boilerplate code to create tables and make database operations. And Room provides compile time verification for our SQL statements. So when we, for example, try to query a column that doesn't exist, 
or if we make a typo in an SQL statement, we can't even compile our code. And this is obviously much better than having the app crash at runtime while someone is already using it. We are going to learn about Room in more detail throughout this video series, but just as a quick overview, we can turn Java classes into so-called entities, which basically each represent a table in the SQLite database. And then we have something called Data Access Object, or short DAO, which is used to communicate with SQLite. The next architecture component that we will use is a class called ViewModel, which basically has the job of holding and preparing all the data for the user interface, so we don't have to put any of it directly into our activities and fragments. Instead, the activity or fragment connects to this view model, gets all the necessary data from there, and then only has the job of drawing it onto the screen and reporting user interactions back to the view model. The view model then forwards these user interactions to the underlying layers of the app, either to load new data or to make changes to the dataset. So the view model basically works as the gateway for the UI controller, which is the activity or fragment, to the rest of the app, and we don't initiate any database operations from our activity directly. So the activity itself doesn't know what is going on down here. This way we keep our activity and fragment classes lean, and the best thing about this view model class is that it survives configuration changes. So as you might know, when we rotate an Android device, or make any other runtime configuration change, like changing the text size of the device, the activity on the screen gets destroyed and recreated for the purpose of providing an alternative layout file or other resources. This also means that we lose the state of this activity and its member variables, and we basically start with a completely new one. In the past, there have been different ways of retaining and recreating the data, like saving and restoring variables in the different lifecycle callback methods of the activity. We also had to start and stop and clean up different asynchronous operations, like network calls in the correct lifecycle methods, otherwise we would get bugs, memory leaks and crashes. And all of this made our activities pretty huge pretty quickly, because we always would have these bloated lifecycle methods. If you want to know more about that topic, I will put videos about the activity lifecycle and instance state into the info card box in the top right corner of this video. But generally, this whole saving and restoring process gets very complicated very quickly, it's prone to errors, and it also wastes resources because we sometimes have to reissue cards that have already been made. With view models, we don't have this problem anymore because they survive configuration changes. And our new activity just receives the same view model instance that still contains all the data. In our app, the only data source will be our room database, and our connection point to SQLite will be the DAO. But the view model will not call methods on the DAO directly. Instead, there will be another class in between called the repository. This is just a simple Java class and not something special from the architecture components library, but it's a recommended approach because in the repository we can mediate between different data sources, like our local SQLite database and the web service. And the view model doesn't have to interact with the different data sources directly. It doesn't have to care about where the data comes from or how it is fetched, and instead the repository creates this clean API where the view model can connect to. So it's just another abstraction layer that helps us modularize our app, and it gives our view model a single access point. In this tutorial we won't fetch data from the internet, but we will still use a repository. Okay, so these are the different layers of our app, and this is also the recommended architecture now. You have probably already heard about MVP and MVVM, and abbreviations like that. And this approach constitutes an MVVM architecture, short for model view view model, where the data source is the model, the activities and fragments build a view, or the user interface in other words, and the view model class is obviously the view model. And if we implement this correctly, we have a nice clean architecture, where all layers are modular and decoupled from each other, and every part has a well-defined responsibility. Every layer only knows about the component directly below it. The view model gets the data from the repository, but it doesn't have to know how the data is retrieved from the different sources. And the UI controller draws the data from the view model onto the screen, but it doesn't have to store the data itself or initiate any database operations directly. But that's not all. There is another important architecture component that will play a major role here, and that is live data. Live data is a wrapper that can hold any type of data, including lists, and it can be observed by the UI controller, which means that whenever the data in this live data object changes, the observer automatically gets notified with the new data and can refresh the UI in reaction to it. Another great thing about live data is that it is lifecycle aware, which means that it knows when the activity or fragment that observes it is in the background, 
and automatically stops updating it until it comes back into the foreground. So we don't have to manually stop and resume observation in our activities and fragments lifecycle methods. And it also cleans up any references when the associated lifecycle, for example the activity, is destroyed. So to summarize, we have the view model that survives configuration changes. And in it we have observable life data that automatically does the right things at the right time in the lifecycle of our activities and fragments. And together this saves us from a lot of lifecycle related problems and potential bugs and memory leaks. In the future, instead of starting and stopping things in our activities and fragments, it will be much more common to just initiate an operation one time in onCreate and then forget about it. Now, usually we have to take care of updating the data in this live data object ourselves. But since Room is designed to work perfectly together with the other architecture components, it can return live data out of the box and we don't have to take care of updating it. This means we can observe data in our database and whenever we make any changes to the database, we can update our UI immediately. And this is why when we add new data or make any changes to it, everything gets displayed immediately because this is live data. Okay, so this is the general overview about the architecture of our app and we will start building it in the next video. So make sure to subscribe to the channel to not miss that. And if this video was helpful, please leave a like. Take care.